Hello, everybody. Welcome to Portal to Ascension. I am your host, Neil Gore. Thank you all so much for being here with me today. We have an extremely special um, interview today. And if you guys do not know, I am Neil from Portal to Ascension. We are <clears throat> we are an online university for all things conscious and consciousness. We deal with topics on extraterrestrial awareness, UFO disclosure, ancient civilizations, the evolution of consciousness, anything really that can assist humanity in empowering themselves so that we can create a reality based on unity, transparency, disclosure, and truth. So through that, we present different speakers. Um, we have an online university of webinars, plus we do live events and tours. And this is going to be a series of webinars that we're starting actually today, leading up to the end of October, where our big event is, where we're going to bring on different people to discuss their opinions and perspectives and research on topics, uh, predominantly UFOs and also ancient civilizations and uh, ancient forbidden archaeology. So today, we're going to bring on a UFO researcher that has been actually in the field or interested in UFOs since 1961. His name is Norio. And even though I've been in this community for around 16 years, I have been on the, the consciousness side for the most part. And I delved into UFOs, even though it's a huge part of what we do. However, I do not know everybody who has done this, especially some of the people who actually laid the groundwork for a lot of others to come in the future. And I'm super honored to actually have synchronistically run into Norio just recently um, through a connection through Paula Harris, in which now I'm aware of Norio's information and the work he's doing and, uh, and has done. He is actually, he describes himself here, and I'll pull up his bio so I can just give you a little insight on who Norio is. And he describes himself as an unorthodox ufologist in the sense that his main interest is on the UFO culture and the diversity of beliefs held by UFO enthusiasts, including himself. himself. He often discusses how he became convinced of the reality of UFO phenomena and his how his skeptical mom, mom had a sighting of what she clearly described then as a flying saucer in 1975 during broad daylight in Japan. And um, Norio, he's actually considered from his Wikipedia page right here, an American activist who lives in New Mexico. He's currently the director of Civilian Intelligence Central, a citizen oversight committee, and has appeared on Coast to Coast AM multiple times and is most known for his ufology investigations in and around New Mexico and the American Southwest. So Norio, thank you so much for being here, brother. Welcome. Thank you, Neil, for having me on your program. I was pleasantly surprised that you had this system where you can talk to a lot of people on uh, Facebook. Yeah, definitely. And it was interesting that we had that connection and we discovered that area in which you had already been doing research for, because as soon as I found out that you had been doing research for Tejon Ranch and in the grapevine, I knew that we could plug you into the system and bring that information out because I've been doing some research on what you have actually been doing over the last couple of decades, just over the last few weeks. And you've actually touched on many, many subjects. So why don't you just go ahead and tell us about who you are, how you got into this, you know, and what your passion is about this. Well, I, as I told you a little while ago, I got into all this around 1961 when I was still living in Japan. And uh, when I was growing up, uh, my father used to tell me of his sighting of a strange greenish ball of fire in the summer of 1947 while he was night fishing in the Bay of Yokohama. And he used to tell us at the dinner table, I was just a small kid, and he used to tell us almost, uh, you know, many times at the dinner table uh, with my mother and my sister. So. Uh, I grew up hearing about my father's strange uh, claim of his sighting. And of course, my mother was uh, kind of skeptical, but I was quite impressed. And so that's the beginning of how I got interested in this whole uh, UFO thing since, uh, uh, you know, when I was small. And uh, in 19, uh, well, in 1964, I was reading a newspaper article about a strange incident that took place in a small unknown town, as far as the world was concerned then, called Socorro, New Mexico in 1964, that a patrol officer had witnessed a strange oval-shaped metallic object just sitting around uh, 300 feet in front of him on the desert with a tripod. 
And uh, when the officer saw that object, he also saw two short entities with white coveralls touching the object. And as soon as the two entities realized that they were being watched by a patrol officer about 300 feet away, they hurriedly went back inside this craft and the craft took off at a tremendous speed uh, from that area. And uh, this incident was reported worldwide through AP wires and UPI and it was on the newspapers, uh, even uh, in Japan, in an English newspaper. And so that's what I heard the first time about New Mexico. I, I wasn't that much uh, knowledgeable about New Mexico uh, at that time. But coincidentally, the following year in 1965, I received a scholarship from a college in New Mexico in Albuquerque. And uh, so that was a strange coincidence and uh, well, I'm a kind of a person that really don't believe in coincidences. I think that something was meant to be. And so that, that's when I began, uh, you know, I came to uh, New Mexico in 1965. And uh, you know, ever since that time, I've been uh, interested in ufology, uh, but what changed my direction was around 1978 when I began to devour books by authors like Jack Vallee and John A. Keel in the 1970s, late 1970s, and my belief in ufology uh, took a dramatic turn from that point on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a firm believer in the reality of the UFO phenomenon, as you uh, uh, probably seen in my bio, but uh, I do believe that the phenomenon is real. But what that phenomenon is, is uh, not really clear even now. But my activities continued through the 1980s and 1990s. In 1990, I began to investigate uh, the facility presently worldwide widely known as Area 51 in Nevada. And, uh, you know, I began to investigate other facilities of importance in California, such as the Northrop Radar Cross-Section Facility uh, at the edge of Tejon Ranch, uh, at the bottom of the uh, Tehachapi Mountain Range. Right. And uh, it was there at the Northrop Radar Cross-Section Facility that in 1993, a group of us, five of us, witnessed a strange uh, silverish incandescent balls of light, uh, just like, uh, you know, five or six, seven lights, just like a, a string of pearls in the sky, just uh, elongating and contracting as it flew uh, above us uh, while we were standing at the fence of the Northrop uh, you know, uh, facility at the fence of that facility, and uh, that was in Tejon Ranch. And we found out that uh, there are several strange facilities in Southern California surrounding the Antelope Valley, and one of that is the uh, uh, Tejon Ranch area. Uh, people have been had been seeing some strange uh, lights and orbs the size of basketballs just floating and uh, well, you know, many residents in that area had witnessed a nightly appearance of cement trucks, perhaps 20 cement trucks in a row uh, on a daily, on a nightly basis, doing some kind of a digging or something in that uh, bottom of the Tehachapi Mountains. And that's basically what the story is about the um, facility right. in well, uh, Ranch, which is interesting. Area. It's interesting because the way we found it was, and we already shared the story with you, is we're on our way up north to San Rafael with Paula Harris. There's traffic on the freeway. There's only one exit to try to get around the traffic. That exit takes you right by the Tejon Ranch headquarters, right? And it has a symbol of a cross because there used to be a mission, I guess, back in the day. 
And um, so we wanted to, I thought it was some sort of cult because it was like a city in the middle of the grapevine where everybody looked like they just stayed there and maybe it was a cult or something. So we actually Googled Teflon Ranch cult. And through Googling that, we found the article with you in 1993 where you explained all of this and we weren't even looking for anything UFO or anything related to that. So as you said, like there is no coincidences. It was super uh, synchronistic. And then two days later, when we're on our way back down, we exit the same exit because we want to take pictures. And there literally is a police car every 20 feet all the way around the whole headquarters covering it and like filming things and doing all types of stuff. So we just got scared and, and headed out really quickly. Well, uh, in Southern California, there are many other, uh, you know, uh, isolated uh, areas in yes. which some strange uh, uh, facilities exist, but uh, mainly many of these facilities go under the name of RC, uh, you know, testing, uh, radar cross-section mm -hmm. uh, facilities. So for example, if you go near uh, Barstow, California, there's an area called the uh, Hellendale, a small town, and outside of Hellendale is a very interesting facility operated by Lockheed Corporation, mm -hmm. and since around the late 1980s, they have been testing some strange shaped aircraft just, uh, you know, uh, placed on a pylon, and the entire pylon comes from underground uh, automatically at a, a certain time, and uh, they test uh, mm. the stealth capability of these uh, uh, triangular shaped uh, aircraft that Lockheed had been testing for many years. But, uh, you know, there are many, many uh, of these uh, uh, RCS, radar cross-section facilities in Southern California, not to mention other facilities such as uh, Air Force Plan 42 in Palmdale, California. Now, Air Force Plan 42 in Palmdale, California is where presently uh, they are building a large hangar to uh, place the, the latest American um, supersonic uh, remotely controlled uh, aircraft called B-21. And the B-21 is being built by Northrop Corporation and uh, the Air Force Plan 42 in Palmdale is a conglomerate facility operated by Northrop and Lockheed and several other contractors and there's a special area called S4, or Section 4, inside Air Force Plant 42, and that's where the uh, B-21 is being assembled and probably being flown to Edwards Air Force Base nearby, and also to Area 51 in Nevada for actual testing, which I believe is either happening now or just about to happen in Nevada. Right. So is Edwards Air, Air Force Base, when I looked at a map of it, it looks like it's huge firstly, but then it looked like the Tejon Ranch was a part of Edwards Air Force Base. Is that the case? Well, that entire area, uh, you know, uh, east or west of uh, Edwards Air Force Base was a private area, but, uh, you know, if you go about 10 miles west of the Edwards Air Force Base on, I believe, 180th Street, you get to, eventually, to uh, Northrop Tejon Ranch facility. And so that whole area, the Antelope Valley, is filled with uh, uh, these facilities. Right, and um, I'm actually gonna pull up uh, a screen share here of the area so we can show people what we're talking about. So firstly, do you think that this is kind of like another Area 51 or not even on the level of that? Oh yes, definitely. You know, Area 51 in Nevada is not the only, uh, you know, interesting facility or uh, COVID facilities in the United States. There are other facilities that are just as significant and you're talking about Edwards Air Force Base and there are two sections to Edwards Air Force Base. There's a section called North Edwards. The North Edwards uh, Air Force Base is much more important in that 
this is where, uh, you know, a lot of secret tests going on. Uh, the Edwards Air Force Base, uh, the larger area is basically, uh, as you see, is, uh, you know, for testing of other aircraft and so on, but North Edwards is the location, uh, right, right, just north of uh, Edwards, right there. That's where secret secret tests go on. So oh, interesting. Uh, I, I would uh, encourage people who are into this to visit North Edwards Base. Uh, you will probably be uh, surprised to see some uh, strange hangars over there and so on. Right, and you can see right here on the map, here's Edwards Air Force Base. There's North Edwards right there. And then the area that we're talking about in the grapevine is right here, right? Right where Lebec is, is that, is that correct? I believe so, to the right of it, uh, where there was a blue, uh, I think, uh, well, I would say uh, that is about right because uh, there is a dry lake. Well, that's actually uh, Castaic Lake, so it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, much to the east of that, much okay. to the east of that. Right. So what is, what is Tejon Ranch headquarters? Is that just a regular real estate company that sells the land there? Or is that maybe a front for what could be happening? Well, Tejon Ranch is a, a private, uh, you know, ranch. Okay. Uh, it's very possible that the government had acquired part of that ranch. And we're not talking about the main area. We're talking about the eastern portion of the Tejon Ranch. Right. Is uh, at the foothills of Tehachapi Mountain. And that's the, the one that you're showing right now is the Northern Tejon Radar Cross-Section Facility looking south, southeast. And this facility is way, way to the east of the actual Tejon Ranch headquarters, way, way east. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they could be testing anti-gravity technology there? Well, it's very difficult to say what's being tested besides yeah. radar cross-sections. Right. Because people had actually reported things uh, floating over the facility for many years, you know, and uh, seeing strange lights and, uh, uh, you know, actually I had personally witnessed an Air Force vehicle enter the ranch. Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, on this Northrop Tejon Ranch facility, there is an entrance or a gate that says, Beware of cattle, but uh, there is no cattle over there. But uh, an Air Force uh, vehicle uh, came and entered that uh, ranch, and we saw the uh, fully uniformed Air Force officials riding in the car. So right. there's no doubt that it's connected to the Air Force, no doubt. Do you, are there more than one uh, private military co company there? Besides Northrop, like is Lockheed there, Bigelow, anybody oh. join efforts? The Northrop Tejon Ranch is basically Northrop. It's, uh, it's just a Northrop. Uh, okay. Lockheed has its own place in uh, Hellendale, mm -hmm. uh, California, which is, you know, way, way to the northeast of that whole Antelope Valley near Barstow, just southwest of Barstow, California. But uh, this is uh, operated, Tejon Ranch is operated by Northrop Corporation. And the Northrop Corporation is very significant these days because it acquired the contract with the government to build the most advanced uh, remotely controlled uh, aircraft known as bomber, uh, known as the B-21, and yeah. which is being tested right now either at Area 51 or even at North Edwards Base, or possibly at Edwards Base Air Base proper. Right. So in 1993, when I think the article was from 1993, but you also came out with a book called UFOs, The Grand Deception and the Coming New World Order back in the same year, I believe. What was, um, what was the intention of the book? Could you give us a little synopsis of how it related to your research at the time? Well, at that time, I was convinced that the government could use some of these technologies to stage some kind of a fake extraterrestrial event mm -hmm. to create some kind of panic to create a forced global government of some sort, some sort. And this idea 
uh, was shared also by my colleague at that time, uh, Bill William Cooper. Mm -hmm. William Bill Cooper had the same idea around, uh, you know, 1992, 1993, that the government has all these technologies to stage a fake extraterrestrial type of landing or contact or event to create global panic, panic to force the people to get united and to beg for uh, a, a strong global system to defend the earth from outside uh, forces. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's still a possibility? I wouldn't say it's not a possibility because, uh, you know, this, will, this idea had been uh, promoted many times by people like Kissinger yeah. in the early 1990s. He said uh, the best thing for the world to get united is to create a, a, a fake extraterrestrial type or external threat from yeah. outer space in order to create uh, global unity. And, uh, you know, uh, people like, uh, at that time, Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev uh, did uh, make similar statements that uh, mm. the only way to unite the world is exactly we are faced with an external threat from outer space right right so that's yeah. always possible right and actually the narrative of uh, a, an alien threat hasn't stopped at all it's been continuously being said by new presenters so it's still pretty much a predominant thing in the community right now where people are actually saying that this is a possibility you know exactly and, um, so, but how would that look? Maybe through like some holographic kind of um, um, staged event or well, what do you feel? Well, uh, you know, everybody knows that the Air Force came out uh, about 15 years ago with this uh, program called 2025, mm -hmm. which they outlined the future uh, program that they could implement in, in uh, by 2025. <laughs> using airborne hologram or holographic projector, airborne projector, and create an illusion of a flying saucer or any illusion in the atmosphere uh, to, uh, you know, present uh, a simulation of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, UFOs or any kind of things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they have that program 2025 uh, you know, and we're, we're in 2018, that, that's seven years from now, and imagine the state of art in technology uh, every year that swiftly changes and improves uh, uh, at a tremendous rate. So I wouldn't be surprised if we have sufficient technologies in a, in a few more years to actually simulate anything yeah. they want. So yeah. I think people like... Uh, uh, well, uh, Serge Monast from uh, Canada, who is okay. the East, uh, he, he uh, came up with this uh, project Blue Beam in 1993, and uh, he started accusing that the government through uh, NASA and others uh, had been contemplating such a program uh, called Project Blue Beam, and uh, you know, I actually corresponded with Serge Monast of Canada in 1993, I believe, uh, for a while. And then uh, suddenly, uh, I think two years later, uh, he had a heart attack and passed away in Canada, which was a strange coincidence. But, uh, you know, uh, without uh, the Serge Monast's uh, Project Blue Beam idea, uh, many people will not really have stressed the importance of the uh, staging of uh, fake extraterrestrial events because right. some of these technologies, including some of the Tesla technologies, yeah. are part of what Serge Monast called uh, mind control uh, technologies or simulation technologies. And so it's not science fiction. We do have technologies to project images in the sky without even having a bunch of clouds in the background. You know, in the beginning, they needed some kind of a clouds to uh, make a screen. But uh, nowadays, the holographic technology has improved so much that you don't need a screen anymore. It's a 
three-dimensional uh, image projection is possible. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So let's let's shift a bit now. I want to go back to Area 51. I read somewhere that you said that whatever comes out of Area 51, aliens and UFOs, you're skeptical on. So could you speak on that a little bit and then maybe also speak, is, do you, is Area 51 still in use or is it, so with all the, in, the, all the interest in Area 51 right now, to me it seems like it's the perfect uh, place to put everybody's attention while they do operations somewhere else. What's your take yeah, on all that? You're absolutely right. But uh, the fact is that Area 51 has never closed. In fact, it's expanding every year. At this present moment, there are at least 2,000 to 2,300 employees uh, working on various programs for various contractors, such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, Northrop, uh, you know, Raytheon, and uh, Lockheed, and McDonnell Douglas, and so on, and TRW even. So there are at least a dozen contractors right now working on various programs at Area 51 uh, with uh, American employees uh, who are not privy to uh, look at other teams, uh, you know, uh, work. It's called compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. so that they won't know what's going on in, in general. So there are many, many programs going on, including uh, remotely controlled platforms or unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned man combat aerial vehicles and so on and uh, you know these are integrated with uh, aeronautic uh, you know uh, technologies and avionics you know but uh, you know as I told you a lot, little while ago uh, just uh, uh, either they are testing B-21 right now or about to test B-21 right now because uh, uh, two years ago, the Air Force confiscated, uh, confiscated the, the, the last remaining uh, location on the uh, Groom Mountain from which you can see Area 51, and that was the uh, Groom Mines, uh, the Sheehan uh, Groom Mines. Mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force uh, confiscated that uh, Groom Mine just two years ago and created this tremendous uproar in Nevada and uh, but uh, finally the Air Force won and the Air Force paid about three or four million dollars to take that entire Groom Mines from where you can see the facility so clearly and so uh, it, they were so desperate to get the last piece of land where you can see Area 51 because they knew that they had to have a, a place where nobody could see the testing of things like B-21. Mm -hmm. And do you think, so from all your research, um, you said earlier that, you know, uh, about the UFOs and what they are and are they reverse engineering technologies, are they extraterrestrials, is it just advanced human technology? From your research, what is your take on what they're doing? Well, unfortunately, we have no evidence whatsoever that Area 51 is connected with any alien presence or any UFO presence. Uh, Area 51, to me, is a very important facility that hopefully, hopefully, researches uh, new uh, weapon systems integrated with avionics and aeronautics for national defense uh, because uh, it uses our hard-earned tax dollars and uh, we have every right to know what's going on at Area 51 because it's yeah. our tax dollars. But, uh, you know, we need to have, uh, you know, uh, accountability, accountability because uh, until uh, 2000, uh, well, I think around 2003, uh, the government was, uh, burning toxic materials at the uh, desert surrounding Area 51. And uh, many of the workers that worked at the Area 51 base became sick because of the use of chemicals that caused these workers to have uh, cancer and, uh, you know, physical illness. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, uh, because of activism like the civilian intelligence, uh, you know, groups and other uh, activist groups, uh, the government finally 
admitted the existence of Area 51 and stopped the burning of toxic chemicals at Area 51. So I'm glad that uh, that's the case right now. So if you look at uh, uh, satellite uh, photos, uh, you can hardly see any burning now. Oh, so that's part of the result of uh, you know the importance of uh, civilian activism. But right. as far as aliens and UFOs, unfortunately, there's no evidence whatsoever that uh, it's connected to Area 51. But I believe that the Air Force benefited from uh, people's belief in such things in order to create a laughter curtain surrounding that important facility so people will just make fun of anybody who researches right. this subject. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so let's move on to Roswell now. I mean, not Roswell, excuse me, New Mexico. There's been a New Mexico seems to be a, a hot spot for UFO activity. There was the San Antonio crash of 45, obviously Roswell, a lot of sightings around um, nuclear test sites, and then also the Dulce base, which was also in New Mexico. So what is your take on the importance of New Mexico, and why don't you give us like an insight on what the Dulce base case is? Well, the importance of New Mexico lies in the, uh, the fact that New Mexico is the state where the uh, nuclear age actually began, mm. you know, uh, <laughs> before the uh, conclusion of the World War, the Manhattan Project, uh, Los Alamos, mm -hmm. and uh, then, uh, you know, in 1945, they tested the uh, nuclear uh, bomb in Alamogordo. So New Mexico is the uh, uh, central location for the post-war development of uh, the, the, the nuclear age and the age of rockets and also the beginning of the uh, black programs and New Mexico is so important in the sense that there is this uh, White Sands Missile Range uh, south of New Mexico which is today the leading edge technology location for directed energy weapon systems such as laser weapons and mm. so on. And of course, New Mexico is the location of the uh, Sandia National Laboratories inside Kirtland Air Force Base. And, uh, you know, there are so many uh, important projects going on in Kirtland Air Force Base. And strangely enough, it was in 1947, the very same year of the alleged Roswell incident, 1947, that Kirtland Air Force Base started. In fact, Sandir Corporation Laboratory started in 1947, the very same year that the CIA started, 1947, and the very same year that NSA, National Security Agency, this also started in 1947, the very same year that things seemed to have, uh, you know, opened up a brand new age in 1947, and uh, of course, we really don't know what crashed outside of Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, but it was something to do with the covert program of high altitude reconnaissance, reconnaissance uh, item that the Air Force uh, was testing. But, you know, all these stories you hear about Area 51 or Roswell and so on, pointing to the alien origin of these stories. These uh, stories have no actual basis, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a cover story to conceal other programs. Now, yeah, I heard that before. Yes, now let's talk about uh, other locations in uh, New Mexico, such as Aztec, New Mexico, uh, which in 1948, something allegedly crashed outside of Aztec, uh, we really don't know the truth behind this. Something may have taken place. And then, of course, something took place in 1945 in the small town of San Antonio, New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, north of Socorro, uh, in which, this was in August of 1945, something crashed outside this community of San Antonio, New Mexico. And, uh, you know, then we have the 1950 Farmington case, where residents of Farmington, New Mexico, near the Four Corners area, witnessed 
at least 300 to 400 metallic silver uh, colored objects floating and manipulating, maneuvering over the town of Farmington, New Mexico on March uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th of 1915. Three days in a row during lunchtime and uh, hundreds of uh, uh, residents of Farmington witnessed these uh, appearances of some 300 to 400 objects just uh, maneuvering over their town and this was unheard of and even to this day we still don't know what happened uh, unfortunately there are no photos that are good enough there's just a couple of uh, black and white photos of what appears to be a hat shaped object you know three or four or five just floating but other than that, there are no uh, actual photos uh, of the Farmington incident. So, regardless, we have the Farmington incident of 1958, uh, 1950, which is still unresolved. And then we have the 1948 alleged crash of something outside of uh, Aztec, New Mexico. And the town of Dulce, New Mexico is located about 120 miles east of Aztec, New Mexico, and the town of Dulce, New Mexico is so important in that it is the main town of the expansive uh, Hikaria Apache Reservation, one of the largest areas uh, for uh, uh, Native American reservation in New Mexico. And this is very important, uh, Neil, because in 1967, the United States government exploded a nuclear device about 22 miles southwest of Dulce, New Mexico on December 10th, 1967, under the name of Project Gas Buggy. And this was only about 22 miles southwest of Dulce, 1967, and the government visited the residents of Dulce and Farmington and Aztec and all nearby communities, telling the folks that on December 10th, if you feel the earth shake a little bit, don't worry. There's going to be a very important test that will be conducted in the nearby area. So the government, uh, you know, uh, alerted the communities. And lo and behold, on December 10th, 1967, the United States, through the Atomic Energy Commission, exploded a nuclear device about a mile and a half underground right next to the Hikaria Apache Reservation in Carson National Forest. And uh, it caused all kinds of havoc. People had seen uh, some kind of a small miniaturized mushroom cloud uh, appear and the ground shook. Uh, definitely something exploded and of course uh, the government uh, had already told the people that they were going to do this in order to help the uh, people in northern uh, New Mexico, uh, you know, uh, benefit from the uh, uh, oil in that area because one of the reasons for this project was to create uh, some kind of a, you know, a thing where they could uh, loosen the hard rocks under that entire area in order to ease the flow of natural gas in that entire area. And this was, uh, well, this experiment did bring about the, uh, uh, you know, the oils, natural gas, and in that area. And so, of course, even now, if you visit Highway 537 and near Dulce, you can see, uh, you know, many, uh, you know, natural gas uh, pumping stations and so on. So, actually, this was to them a good thing, but unfortunately, the government uh, made a mistake in the sense that they didn't realize that 10 years later, radiation from this experiment had created uh, some kind of a you know, hazard, health hazard, uh, to people and to local animals, such as cows. And so, you know, this experiment 
Project Gas Buggy, even though it took place on December 10th, 1967, uh, 10 years later, it was when the radiation slowly began to uh, spread and created uh, health hazard among uh, animals in that local area. And uh, it's my opinion and the opinion of some other researchers, such as the late Dave Valdez, who was the state patrol officer in charge of the Dulce area for many, many years, began to theorize that uh, the government began to admit covertly admit that they made a mistake in uh, uh, creating this radiation uh, hazard uh, in the cows and the, even humans in that area. And so, uh, you know, by that time in 1975 and, you know, for 10 years or so, the ranchers in Dulce had lost many, many cows in the ranch to a strange cattle mutilation uh, scenes and uh, many of the ranchers had seen uh, military helicopters or some kind of ve aerial vehicle that apparently picked up some uh, pre-selected cows of the ranch and uh, then dropped them off uh, after three or four days later uh, all mutilated you know mm -hmm. and so uh, Gabe Baldez officer Gabe Baldez came to the conclusion that it was the government which was secretly testing certain kinds of, uh, you know, local cows to measure the radiation effect from the 1967 Project Gas Buggy thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there are some other people who believe that there is definitely something in addition that's going on in the Dulce area. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I am going to talk about in uh, this uh, upcoming weekend in Dulce, New Mexico, where they are having the fourth and the last final Dulce Base Conference in Dulce, New Mexico. This is the last conference ever that's going to be held. Uh, the Hikari Apache Nation has been very uh, cooperative uh, in that even though they were afraid to have this kind of conferences uh, in the, right in the middle of the Hikari Apache Reservation, uh, they began to, you know, uh, welcome uh, some of the outsiders, uh, such as us, to talk about the alleged Dose of H. And in, nine, in 2009, I began the first Dose Base conference in 2009. And that was attended by at least 120 people um, from many different states and also the local folks of the Higari Apache Reservation. And uh, it was a successful event. But uh, later on, the Higari Apache the, you know, nation themselves began to hold their own conference. And uh, this weekend, July or June 23rd and 24th, this weekend, is going to be the fourth and the final Dulce Base Conference right in the middle of the town of Dulce. And it was, it's sanctioned by the Hikari Apache Nation, but unfortunately this wow. will be the final conference ever. And we'll have some uh, very interesting speakers such as Bill Burns, who was responsible in creating in 2009 this UFO hunter program on History Channel in which the topic of Dulce was featured. And according to Bill Burns, William Burns, that episode of Dulce was the final uh, episode of the History Channel because the History Channel apparently uh, canceled all other uh, UFO hunter programs after broadcasting or telecasting that uh, uh, Dulce episode. And uh, we're going to hear the details from Bill Burns uh, this weekend. And also, besides me, there will be Edmund Gomez who will be speaking about the mysterious cattle mutilations that caused his whole ranch about, uh, you know, $100,000 in today's 
uh, money uh, because they lost about 20 cows from 1975 to 1985 and to 19, late 1980s, yeah, 20 cows to some strange mutilations. And uh, Edmund Gomez is going to tell how uh, his ranch found out which cattle were going to be taken up because they, uh, once the cattle was abandoned or thrown from a military helicopter or some kind of a ve aerial vehicle on the ranch, the cattle was already mutilated, but uh, they found out that there was on the leg of the cow uh, some kind of a glow stick, uh, you know, fluorescent uh, marking. So according to uh, Edmund Gomez, the government already wanted to select which cow they are going to pick up to find out about radiation and possibly for some other programs like, uh, you know, bio bio-warfare programs. Maybe they were testing some kind of, uh, you know, anthrax or some kind of thing. Uh, so this is going to be a very, very interesting conference uh, in Dulce, New Mexico. And uh, we have a speaker such as Greg Bishop, who is a friend of mine, who wrote a book, uh, you know, about 10 years ago uh, called, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the National Security and the creation of a modern myth. Uh, it's called Project Beta. The, the national security and the creation of a modern myth in which he explains the whole scenario of how the Dulce story was created by the Air Force mm. uh, in uh, the Kirtland Air Force Base in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so, uh, you know, I'm of the opinion also that the Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque uh, was partially responsible for uh, the bringing up the Dulce story. And uh, it was through Paul Benowitz, who lived right across from the Manzano uh, underground nuclear storage facility in 1979, 1980, Paul Benowitz filmed uh, strange lights that was floating over the Manzano area uh, across from his residence and the uh, Air Force got worried and this uh, brought uh, Richard C. Doty to contact uh, Paul Benowitz right away and the Richard C. Doty apparently succeeded in convincing Paul Benowitz that he should not be looking at something across from his residence, you know, uh, to the uh, Manzano uh, underground facility and uh, stop looking at those lights that were floating in that area, but should put his attention to uh, an important northern New Mexico facility called Dulce, New Mexico. And that supposedly the beginning of the Paul, uh, the uh, uh, Richard C. Doty's of the, uh, the Doty of the Air Force Office of Special Investigation to convince uh, Paul Benowitz that he should focus his attention not on the uh, Manzano storage facility, but uh, 200 miles away north on a small, you know, on a, well, Hickory Apache Reservation Dulce area, which uh, some people, according to some researchers, uh, the the uh, that's when the uh, Paul Benowitz started, uh, uh, you know, visiting those in New Mexico, and he flew over the Archuleta Mesa, and indeed he did see some strange structures on the mesa. But according to some researchers, like uh, Greg Bishop and others, the Air Force may have set up some kind of a temporary structures to convince Paul Benowitz that there was something over the Archulator Mesa mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Dulce. And, uh, but, uh, you know, this topic is very complicated. Uh, you know, so without Richard C. Doty and Paul Benowitz, there's no Dulce story, period. There's no Dulce story without the uh, Paul Benowitz of 1979 and 1980. And that's the whole beginning of the Dulce story. But what's amazing Neil, is the fact that Richard C. Doty uh, carelessly gave Paul Benowitz some 
real information about Dulce area. And that is to say that, according to a few researchers, you know, something did crash on Mount Archuleta, which is located northwest of the Archuleta Mesa in Dulce, in around 1982 or 83. Some kind of a prototype American triangular stealth craft, which may not have been F-117. It may have been different type of a maybe a, a aircraft. Uh, maybe according to uh, Paul Benowitz, he believed that it was some kind of a nuclear powered aircraft that crashed on Mount Archuleta in either 1983 or 1982, I'm not sure exactly, but, uh, uh, you know, that was the suggestion of Richard C. Doty, who uh, unwittingly gave that information to uh, Paul Benowitz. So Paul Benowitz mm -hmm. started visiting Dulce, and actually he did see some strange things uh, in the, uh, uh, while he was looking at Archuleta Mesa, and the fact is, Neil, that there is something there. I can really say that there may not be a Dulce underground facility at all, but I am convinced that there is some kind of a paraphysical phenomenon still mm -hmm. going on in the entire Dulce region, which is filled with local myths and beliefs mm -hmm. of the local people, such as, uh, you know, beliefs about some strange entities like skinwalkers or even Bigfoot huh. all in that area still claim to have seen and occasionally still sees what they call Bigfoot uh, in the Navajo River area of Dose and people still see some strange uh, milica uh, military helicopters flying over there and uh, in fact uh, in my website I believe I showed uh, the actual footage taken by Laureen Willis uh, of uh, Dulce just last year. It shows uh, five or six helicopters, military helicopters, just flying uh, and doing something on, by Archuleta Mesa. And so there's still something there. there, there there's, there's no evidence whatsoever. And I've been, uh, I've been in Dulce since 1990 and I have yet to see any tangible concrete proof of a physical underground base, but I'm convinced that the testimonies of local folks uh, about seeing some strange uh, objects and experiencing some strange uh, goings on uh, uh, convince me that that whole area is filled with still unknown phenomena that we still don't understand. And I believe that the government as well as maybe the Air Force, is aware that that area is a special area where some of these paraphysical phenomena may actually be going on, you know. And so I'll be talking about this on uh, June the 24th, Sunday, this weekend. Uh, and Sunday, June 24th, by the way, is a very important date because mm -hmm. it's the date of the uh, Kenneth Arnold uh, uh, Flying Soul Society of 1947, mm. on June uh, 24th. And so it, it's a very important day. But uh, I'm so excited, Neil, that I'll be part of this final Dose of Ace conference this year. Yeah. And you said it's been going on for four years, right? That's right. This uh, Dose of Ace UFO conference, which has been organized by the Hikaria Apache Nation, mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be the last one. And, uh, you know, uh, so I don't know what's going on, uh, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. So I encourage those of you who live in New Mexico to attend this uh, conference. I'm sure that they can just walk in and just uh, participate, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, attend the, the, uh, the conference. Yeah. And um, being in the community of ufology, I've heard about the Dulce Base Conference for the last few years, I've known about it. So it is a really well-known one within the community. A simple search of UFO conferences will actually, Dulce Base Conference will be on the first page. So I would say to everybody that since this is the last one and this is a really huge and impactful event, that um, if there's anything in your 
power to be there, whether you're in the state or even out of state and you can travel there, please, uh, please attend it. Right now, there's a lot of these conferences happening worldwide and I'm excited for it because this just goes to show that there's a collective movement for this information, you know? So we all need to go there and support each other and just bring this information out and share it to everybody. Right, Nuria? Exactly, you said it right. Right, so Norio, I want to um, leave off with maybe leaving it open to if you wanted to say anything or maybe give us some insight about what's next for you and what you're going to be doing. And then again, tell people the website so they can register for a Dulce Base conference. Yes, all you have to do is just uh, do the Google search and just uh, search for 2018 Dulce Base UFO conference and you'll get a lot of information. And as for me, this may be my last appearance ever that in which I will be talking about UFOs because uh, I believe that uh, this uh, UFO phenomenon is insolvable. And mm -hmm. that's my conclusion. I've been involved in the ufology since 1961. And even to this day, I cannot clearly state what the true nature of this strange phenomenon is, and I'm the first one to admit that I'm just as lost as in 1961 when I first started researching about the UFO uh, subject, but I believe that this is a very, very important subject matter, and UFOs, I believe personally, is probably the most important topic yep. in one's life because it involves everything. Mm -hmm. It involves the uh, what reality is, mm -hmm. which we still don't know exactly what it is. And, uh, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, I've had uh, many years of research, and uh, with this uh, Dose Base Conference, I will temporarily retire from uh, further investigation on this strange wow. problem, and I will be concentrating on my uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, music. And uh, I believe that music is very important because it... Uh, uh, soothes the uh, soul of folks and the type of music I play uh, relaxes people and uh, also entertains people and uh, you know so I will go on playing uh, live music with my uh, keyboard and I try to uh, uh, you know uh, play some uh, very cosmic type music as well as blues and rhythm and blues type music I can do practically a whole genre of music with my uh, uh, a keyboard and my speakers and my uh, harmonizers and so on. So, in fact, I will be giving a live music performance along with other uh, bands at Dulce uh, this nice. Saturday. And so I'm looking forward to it because I believe that there's more life uh, to this. Uh, there's more thing to this life than just a, a UFO investigation because, uh, you know, you have to look at the UFO phenomenon from all sides, from the artistic side to the mm -hmm. investigation side. So for a while, I'll be just concentrating on providing and uh, making people happy uh, with my music. So uh, uh, that's what I want to say. In the meantime, uh, people can look at my website, which I, uh, I believe is very helpful. I have so many articles on my website, which is noriohayakawa.wordpress.com noriohayakawa.wordpress.com and there's an index and you can look at the index and see the amazing topics that I discuss including some of my uh, photos that I took uh, this year of some strange cloud formations over mm -hmm. New Mexico which took place on February 10th of this year it was so amazing and other folks have taken some strange photos of strange clouds uh, this year on this on uh, February 10th. So you, you can look at all these items by going to my website, noriohakawa.wordpress.com. Beautiful. And actually, my wife and I checked out some of your music, and I got to say, it's amazing. We felt the energy immediately. As soon as when, when we heard about you and we're driving up Ipala, we stumbled across your music at the same time on the way up north. And we were listening to it in the car, and my wife was like, she loves like your style of music and everything. She was like, it's actually good with it. So you're uh, really good, man. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you know, because I'm a kind of a person that tries to be uh, open-minded, 
and I have a variety of things. You know, even my music have has a lot of varieties, ranging anywhere from cosmic type music to uh, down home country yeah. to uh, bluesy music and a whole bunch. So I believe in <clears throat> variety, and variety is the spice of life. Yep. Norio, brother, I want to thank you so much, man. It's been an honor, and I really want to thank you for pioneering, being one of the pioneers for the movement right now and working with the greats. You've been in this for a long time, and you've kept at it, and your information has permeated this entire field. So I appreciate you very much, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do in the future, bro. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you. God bless you. Okay, take care, Norio. Okay, bye-bye.